Brewing Network. All right, we're talking to Tony Lawrence from Boneyard Brewing Company over here. If you're standing out in the hot sun, come on over and have a seat. Yeah, he deserves a round of applause. Don't be shy. Uh, we're going to pour his beer to the audience right here. We got a couple uh, pitchers right here. You can see the gentleman in the blue Firestone shirt, and he'll give you some of Tony's beer. You don't have to sit here alcohol-free. We're against that at the Behind the Beer booth. Yeah, we are against that. Now, Tony's from Boneyard Brewing Company, which is in Bend, Oregon. And I met Tony a year ago uh, around the Oregon Brewers Festival. I'm going to try to get this right, Tony. I had been drinking when I met you. But there are a couple key things I remember. Uh Uh-oh. You had a really hot girlfriend. Indeed, yes. We went to a strip club at some point. (laughs) You've worked in the beer industry for a long time as uh, more of a consultant and an engineer. You build, you used to help people build their breweries. Did I remember that right? Yeah, overall, actually, uh, I started at Deschutes in 1989. And about 15 years later, I decided to get out and try and get more, uh, to be a well-rounded brewer. I thought it'd be interesting to go out and build breweries and consult and engineer. I was always kind of like a a gearhead, so I applied my car and motorcycle gearhead stuff to my brewery applications, learned how to TIG weld, and just sort of look at breweries from an engineering standpoint, and that's really helped uh, helped me be able to have the imagination, the optimism to start my own brewery, as well as being an accomplished brewer, but to come at it from a, a another side so I didn't have to pay TIG welder $65 an hour. <laughs> And then I, I think I remember that that's kind of how the name Boneyard Brewery came about, too, because through your skills, you were able to piece together a brewery rather than buy some shiny new German brewery and have it shipped over. You built yours. Correct. It was a little serendipitous, really. It wasn't exactly pre-planned. Again, I was trying to really round out my skill set as a brewer. Uh, I love being able to control the whole brewery, not just making the beer-making process. But along my journey uh, through various jobs... One in particular, Three Floyds, I do a lot of work for. So I got my first brewing system from Nick. Actually, my first two brewing systems from Nick at Three Floyds. I got his first five-barrel system, and then I ended up getting his old 20-barrel system. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, exactly. You know, through my, my opportunities and my, my travels working for different breweries, I found a lot of equipment that was not really being, um, it was either out of service, it was broken, it was undervalued, or just not really wanted anymore. And I was like, well, hey, I could use that, and maybe I could polish it here or weld it there and turn it into usable brewing equipment. So that's how we got started. Okay. It's an excellent skill to have because, uh, as you know, uh, brewing equipment can be very, very expensive. And I think you know there are brewers out there that don't know how to uh, engineer their own uh, equipment. So I think you were able probably to build your brewery on a better budget than somebody who has to buy new uh, equipment. It, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there was no budget. There was no business plan. I made a unique acquisition on a five-barrel brew house in the beginning, and I just tried to pay the rent doing what I know how to do, which is to make beer, and I found a way to cobble the equipment together to give myself an opportunity to do that. Um, it's working out really well. I didn't plan for uh, you know, the amount of barrelage we're doing today or any, any type of thing like that. Again, it was just about getting started and swinging the bat. Well, aside from uh, building the equipment, the thing that matters most is the product in the glass. So people must like it if you're, if you're blowing up like that. One of the beers I have right now, you were describing it to me a little bit. It's kind of a tart beer. What yep. is this one here? Well, it's our brand, Femme Fatale. Um, you know, I'm a fan of, like, Duchess and some sour browns and, and Flemish reds. And I really just took kind of a unique approach at it because uh, I didn't want to run a big extensive wild program and, and wait a year for the beer. So uh, it's just a sour brown, re-fermented on faz- raspberries, but we achieve the tartness or sourness from the acidulated malt, of course, in the mash at 5%. And then uh, additions of lactic acid in the brew kettle. And then when I pitch the raspberries for secondary fermentation, I also add malic and acetic acids. Um, so we, we achieve our tartness by cheating a little bit, right. although we do have sour beers. but. I will say that if, if there are those in the audience that don't know anything about sour beers, you just scared the shit out of them with that list of what sounded like chemicals that you put in the beer. But they're not chemicals at all. I'm, 
I pick him up at the local cash and carry restaurant supply. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, the other thing, and, and forgive me for those of you who do know about sour beers, because this will be somewhat redundant, but uh, to make sour beer, for the most part, brewers um, add uh, yeast or, or uh, I don't know if bacteria is the right word, yes. but it takes a, a period of time, a year or more, Correct. for the yeast and bacteria to do its thing to turn a beer sour. But your method here was to be able to turn around the, the beer quicker. You know, in the end, I'm not necessarily uh, have to be worried about being a purist. If uh, if I can achieve the flavors I'm looking for, uh, quick and easy, I'm on I'm on board with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, we do do a sour program as well, and we have a uh, PDO and lacto lacto and everything fermenting in in oak barrels and other other uh, conditioning tanks. But uh, for this particular brand, we chose the quick and easy, dirty method. It really worked. You can uh, in the in the aroma. You can really smell the raspberries. It really comes through. Uh, 13 pounds per barrel raspberries. Of, and what form? Is it like a puree? Yes, yeah, a puree from Oregon Fruit Products. I really like their, uh, their product for sure. Okay. So you can smell that, but then in the taste, it's really not overdriven with fruit. The sourness comes through, and it doesn't taste like a really sweet, fruity beer. Thank you. Uh, with any beer, I think balance is key. I think uh, cleanliness and balance is always what I'm striving for as a brewer. Um, hopefully, after that, we can talk about how interesting it possibly could be. Yeah. If it's not clean and balanced, you don't have a good beer. So that's why I always start from looking at my recipe design. Um, and I do think the raspberry puree lends a good flavor, but it's not overdone. You know, if you come at the, um, uh, the fruit contribution with an extract, I think you, you can really pick that up on your palate. And I, I, it doesn't really please my palate. It's kind of strange because I'm sitting here saying that I took the sour approach quick and easy, but I do the fruit approach uh, much more methodical and, t and uh, the correct way, in my opinion. Sure. Where did you learn to brew? I started at Deschutes in 1989. I was just a, went up there snowboarding and ended up being a dishwasher at Deschutes and then uh, met John Harris, for, uh, formerly of Deschutes, now with Full Sail. And we hit it off and drank beers after work, and he quickly became my mentor. So I got, uh, I fell into it very, you know, lucky. Uh, of course, I was into beers like any 21-year-old kid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're lying. You were 17. Nah. <laughs> Just like the rest of us. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> and you've been doing it for a long time now. I think it shows in the beer. What's the other beer that we're drinking here in the crowd? So uh, that's our pale ale. We don't make that uh, all year round. Uh, for this particular event, they wanted a beer at 5.5 ABV or less, and I didn't have anything in my lineup that met that uh, criteria. Yeah. So I thought it was a good opportunity for me to uh, take a new look at my pale ale, which hadn't been produced in about a year. And uh, whenever I get an opportunity to do, to do that, uh, my clients or my, uh, the flavor profile of the beer in particular, I get, I get an opportunity to redesign the beer because no one's familiar with it anymore. So I'd redesigned it uh, from the hop standpoint. Interestingly enough, it's a Citra Pale Ale, uh, Citra being the hops. And it was the only hop I was long on in my contracts. So it really made, it, it really made a simple decision for me. So uh, we just went 100% Citra Pale, pale uh, Citra Hop, 5.5 ABV. Um, just looking for a good, well-balanced pale ale. The previous year when I was brewing it, I was trying to make it really hoppy, but then at a 5.5 ABV, the balance was all kind of screwed up. Okay. And so this year uh, we redesigned it, and I feel, I feel uh, that I've achieved what I was looking for within having a hoppy beer, but also having a balanced hoppy beer at 5.5. If anybody has any questions for Tony, we got a microphone right up front. Come on up and we'll do it. So I'm a huge fan of, of, a, of pale ale, of the yeah. style. And I think, you know, at a festival like this with so many varieties of beer, some brewers are almost embarrassed when they kind of say, oh, yeah, that's just my pale ale. But I think it's such an amazing and difficult style to brew because of the balance it requires Correct. that it's become a little underrated now that there's so many varieties, you know, big beers and high alcohol. But I love a good pale ale. I love a good pale ale, too. Uh, unfortunately, you know, well, fortunately and unfortunately, obviously our flagship is an IPA like most breweries. Um, at the end of the day, I'd rather drink a really hoppy pale ale because yeah. it's 5.5 or 5.0 ABV and says 7 or 7.5, and you can drink more of them, which is always a goal of mine. Right. And, of course, Firestone's Pale 31 is one of the best pale ales on the planet right now. He wins medals every year. It's just an amazing pale ale. Big influence, Firestone. I think for any brewer, they should be. Uh, I was fortunate. I spent a year with Firestone, actually, about six years ago, and... Uh, that was a, a great year well spent in my brewing career, watching them do what they do and, yeah. and uh, getting out my notebook and keeping some tabs on what they were up to. And I was right. very fortunate to spend a year with Firestone. Very cool. Question. Hey, uh, 
As a, as a brewer, um, I thought I read in the thing, you guys are doing about 10,000 barrels a year or something now? Well, we're just at our two-year anniversary last month. Cinco de Mayo is our, is our anniversary. Very nice. Um, so that, that number's moving quick. I will, okay. in 2012, I expect to do 9,000 barrels. I did 3,000 barrels last year. We're all draft in uh, Oregon and Seattle, and there's not a draw, there's not an empty keg, there's not a full keg on the warehouse floor. Uh, I feel fortunate to participate in this industry. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for what we've been able to do, but I keep it in context. The industry as a whole is really killing it, and uh, we're just fortunate to participate. So, so now, okay, you contract for your hops, basically, Correct. it sounds like. So how much does the availability of hops affect what you're going to brew? That's a great question, and it, it runs the brewery. Uh, <laughs> we are... Mo Currently, I'm really only producing three brands, one being a red ale, and then two uh, IPA and double IPA. Those are the ones that the distributor sells for us. We, we throw in a pale ale or a femme fatale once in a while when we get time, when, there's, when we feel like we can squeeze a, a, a batch in. Um, but my contracts actually run the company. Uh, our IPA has run six different hops, and that's based off um, the availability of hops. I'm not gonna get caught with my IPA being a Simcoe IP, uh, IPA or a Citra IPA. So I'm running Bravo, Centennial, Chinook, Cascade, uh, Citra, and CTZ in my IPA, and I just blend the gamut, and that, that's hedging my, hedging my bets against the volatility of the hop market so I can produce my beer all year round, year after year after year. Is Smart there a lean, man. lean time of year, right? like right now? Is it lean on the hops? Well, I shop long, uh, so I'm long on hops. I'm probably, I shouldn't say this, uh, uh, I'm long on one hop that everybody wants, Amarillo's. And <laughs> it's all sitting at Boneyard. So I, I, I'm, I shop long. I mean, I did 3,000 barrels last year and, and uh, expect to do 9,000 barrels this year. So I don't have enough statistical information to track my, my history. So I've just, I just go big. Uh, so far, it hasn't, it hasn't served me wrong. Thank you. Yeah. It's not gonna, the hops aren't going to go bad. Yes. Oh, we're out of time? With Tony? Tony's having a great time, though. <laughs> and we'd have a, a whole a line of interviews waiting. Uh, I do find it, just back to that question real quick, Tony, I find it funny when brewers tell me, oh, I, I brew whatever I want to brew. That's what I do. No, you don't. You kind of brew whatever's available. <laughs> right now. Like, whatever ingredients you can get, you're honest about it. Well, this pale ale here today is a citra is molly hop. Other than Amarillo, I was long on, so I went big on the citra. Uh, I'm not currently brewing with my Amarillos because I just don't have enough of them. Even though I'm long on them, I don't have enough of them to put any uh, Amarillos into my standard lineup. So I choose not to use them. All right, Boneyard. We'll do one more question. Boneyard beer is available here. If you didn't get any while you're sitting here, just go check out their tent and they're pouring a couple beers. Go ahead. Last question. Yes, two quick questions. What is your favorite beer to drink and what is your favorite beer to make? <laughs> okay, this is this is, this is is going <laughs> to... Let me put my feet up. Uh, so, oh boy, this is tough. All right, so Pilsner's, of course, one of my favorite everyday desert island beers. And uh, to be completely honest, when I go to the gas station, I buy a six pack of Bush or Bush Light. <laughs> yep, it's true. Somebody tweet that right now. <laughs> um, um, as far as making beer, you know, I'm, I'm into the hop thing like everybody else right now. I think it's complex and challenging to make an extremely hoppy beer that's not too bitter and still achieves the balance that I'm looking for. And uh, that's, the, that's the big challenge for my brewery is to, is to continuously try and achieve that. So, hoppy beers. Yeah. Right now I'm into the double IPA. Who couldn't be, though? All right. Round of applause for Tony Lawrence from Boneyard Brewing. You can go see him in Bend or you can have his beer right here. Thanks, Tony. I really appreciate it. All right, coming up next, we Thanks, got Justin. Meg Gill from Golden Road Brewing Company. She's going to sit down with us and talk more beer with you, and we'll try to serve you some of it, too. Sometimes I feel so happy. The Brewing Network. Uh.